Hello, peace lovers and peacemakers. This is Sarah Jamshidi. You are listening to Peace Mindedly podcast show where I feature peaceful bridge makers. At the same time, you are watching the program live on Facebook. So please do. I mean, one thing that I really would like us to do right now is to share this video on your network on the Facebook because it's really important for all of us to have the message of peace and prosperity and kindness to go viral and other people hear about about peace and peaceful bridge makers that I am featuring for this show. Um, and then uh, for this hour, we are talking with uh, Julia Basha. Uh, Basha is an award-winning Brazilian-born American filmmaker. The body of her work focuses on nonviolent resistance of people who decide to take courageous steps to fight against oppression. Basha has used the film to highlight underdocumented stories from the Middle East. Uh, Budrus, a movie she directed independently in 2009, focuses on Palestinian community organizer who unites Pal uh, Palestinians and Israelis to join an unarmed movement to save his village of Budrus. My Neighborhood is completed in 2012, and Neila and the Uprising was uh, her uh, film in 2017. A movie featured uh, Neila Ayesh, a young mother in Gaza, who went through a courageous journey to unite women against Israel occupation during First Intifada. Uh, now, um, uh, Basha is, uh, Julia, is working on a new documentary that I'm going to briefly uh, have her to explain what the documentary is about. And then we are going to talk about uh, other other um, movies and her other, other work. So here, I'm welcoming Julia. Hi, Julia. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me here. In Absolutely. Show. Yes, yes. It's very good to have you. So, yes, um, I mean, I would love to know about your new movie. Can you just tell us about what's happening and what's going on and how come you interested into uh, the movie that you're working on right now? Yeah, thank you. Um, for the past 15 years, I've been working with the team at the nonprofit Just Vision, highlighting the work of Palestinians and Israelis who are using nonviolent resistance to end the occupation and build a future of justice, equality, and peace for both communities in the region. We have made several feature documentaries as well as short films that either at the local level of a, of a neighborhood or at the level of a village in the West Bank or at the national level, in the case of Nile and Uprising, really highlight how individuals can take their future in their own hands by using strategic nonviolent resistance and really transform their realities in powerful ways that often are not chronicled by the mainstream media worldwide. Um, this new project that we're working on is our first film in the United States. And we're looking at individuals across the country who are challenging efforts at the state level to prevent people from organizing and activating for people that they want to support. Um, and this is a project that has been in the works for now 21 months. Um, we are not yet publicly discussing it, but we're hoping to release it in 2021. 2021. Do you have any months for us? No. No. <laughs> and how come um, most of the movies that you work on takes a lot of time, a lot of research and a lot of writing? So I wonder, um, is this common between among film writers and filmmakers or is it you that you want to do a diligent work? It is very common for documentary filmmakers to take years in putting together their projects. Documentary filmmakers are uh, sort of an interesting uh, type of journalism where um, instead of sort of parachuting in and then parachuting out quickly um, from certain situations where you're looking for specific bites and sometimes you know exactly what you want to extract 
from the population that you're making a story about because you already have in your mind a full arc of the story and you just need specific bites to fill in the blanks. Um, documentary filmmakers take a much more observational uh, approach and many of us often spend years uh, with the subjects and the people whose stories we're telling. And we embed ourselves and we become in many ways part of that community um, and want to understand what their um, desires are, where they come from, what's the context. And the films that we create therefore um, are not um, sort of uh, just um, repeating uh, like well-known um, often stereotypes about certain communities, but they often go deeper into the humanity of those communities and reveal something that um, you didn't know before. Uh, often documentary filmmakers have become um, the best investigative journalists of our times, uh, revealing and breaking stories that sometimes take a, um, a long time to research and collect all the data, and then building stories that are often grounded in personal narratives. So again, um, is a very uh, uh, particular trait of documentary films is that we want um, the viewer to identify with the people. Do and you have the this screenplay? So when you go to do the film and movie, have you already written the screenplay? I mean, the the draft, or you are just have things in your mind and you have, you know, have some ideas and then you are going there to explore. So how does this work? You, the, there are no screenplays. Um, mm -hmm. You don't write your story ahead of time. There's a lot of research that goes before you start filming and before you start building trust with the communities that um, you want to document. And so the process generally uh, starts with knowing that there's a particular topic that you want to uh, cover. And then you start um, trying to understand as much as possible around the context, uh, understanding what literature already exists, um, what people have written about it, what films might have been made, consulting with experts um, to feel like you're very well um, equipped um, as you start to ask for people to open their lives for you to be filmed on camera. Yes, yes, absolutely. And Julia, how come the Middle East? So why you are concentrating on the Middle East and particularly the stories between Palestine and Israel? Um, I was born and raised in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And I came to the United States originally to study English for one year and was going to return to Brazil and was already at the time engaged in social justice issues in my home country. Mm -hmm. While I was um, in the U.S., I got very interested in the idea of a liberal arts education, which doesn't exist in Brazil. So at the time, I was actually enrolled in law school in Rio, which is an undergraduate degree. And I discovered um, this idea that for four years in a liberal arts uh, education, you can really explore and expand your mind into multiple subjects without right away trying to professionalize and learn specific skills, but really actually learn the skill of thinking and the, the skill of imagining and uh, contextualizing um, truths. And I love that. And I wanted very much to be able to have that opportunity. Um, so I ended up um, applying and getting accepted at Columbia University and stayed um, to do my college degree here. While I was on campus, September 11 happened, and that was the big uh, shift uh, in my life. It marked a big transition where from being very committed and interested and active on issues relating to social justice in Brazil, I became very interested and committed to international affairs, particularly the role of the United mm -hmm. States um, in countries in the Middle East and uh, foreign policy yeah. matters. And yeah. that made me very interested in, in the Middle East. Yes, it's yes. Perfect. And then you wanted to go to Tehran. Yes. You, yes. And it didn't yeah. happen. You know that I'm from Iran. And that. then you ended up going to Egypt, right? That's right. So I, I at Colombia, I focused on um, uh, Iranian history. 
and had um, fabulous professors. I actually studied the Farsi, uh, Farsi nami dunam. I forgot <laughs> it all at this point. Uh, but at one point, I was um, pretty close to learning it and uh, applied and got accepted to Tehran University at the Dehoda Institute, which is a program for foreign students, um, where I was going to do the first step of getting a master's. Um, I was very encouraged by my professors to, to do that um, and got accepted to the program. But then in 2003, which was when I was supposed to go, the United States invaded Iraq. And um, the interest section that the Iranian government used to have um, in the bunkers of the Pakistani embassy in D.C. closed. And uh, once that closed, I didn't have access anymore to get my visa. Mm -hmm. um, and I was told um, after many weeks of uh, trying to communicate uh, with um, officials in Iran that if I came to a country in the Arab world because I was a Brazilian citizen and at the time I wasn't yet an American citizen like I am now, uh, that I would be granted a visa but I needed to find my way to an Arab country. That was literally my instruction. <laughs> and uh, so I, um, I started trying to get there. And the way that I ended up getting there was through a friend who introduced me to an Egyptian-American filmmaker called Jihan Mujain. Um, and that took me to Cairo, which was the first step in my journey. Yes, yes, first step. And I'm going to go from the first step to the very last step, and then we, we uh, make our way back to, to the journey. But I, I've been reading about your work, about you, about the interviews that you've given. And this is some of, uh, one of the striking uh, and interesting points that I came up with. You said, quote, um, believe you believe putting the story of Palestinian women into the story of women worldwide is a key because it's important to see the connection between struggles, uh, uh, between struggles. And then the question is, you know, I think the statement really resonates with me as an Iranian who was growing up back in Iran. I mean, going through revolution and going through, um, through, war, I've seen this, the, the, the same kind of struggle that Nayla Ayesh, the protagonist in your documentary, went through. I mean, being uh, upfront and one of the major characters of the movie and of the uprising and then later just set aside by the big powerful men so so and then you you, you really want to highlight that in your um, filmmaking and you you really want to say so okay you know, this is happening and we need to be more um, diligent about that. So tell me, tell me about about the statement and how come you think it's important to feature women in in uprising and in struggles. Mm -hmm. uh, so over fifteen years of documenting nonviolent resistance um, by Palestinians and Israelis to build a future for both communities that is filled with justice and with dignity for both societies. I've noticed that uh, when movements include women in leadership positions, they tend to be more successful. And um, I started noticing that and became interested in understanding if there was actually any research or any kind of conclusive um, uh, examination of what role does it play um, when women are included or when women are not included. And in fact, there's been significant research done um, that uh, shows one, that nonviolent resistance um, tends to be 100% more successful than violent resistance, historically and in multiple contexts. Um, Maria Stefan, um, How come? Why it's more? Why? Why is it that? <laughs> um, so there's a, a beautiful uh, work that Maria Stefan and Erica Chenoweth have done. They've published books. They've done essays about it, and I highly recommend people looking up their work. Uh, mm -hmm. They've done like you know very rigorous um, quantitative uh, research looking at um, those questions. And, uh, you know, the, in, in their way of working, they are mostly focused on the data and showing, um, you know, is nonviolent resistance more effective in achieving the aims of the people who are uh, doing it or not? 
Um, there's obviously interpretations that many people can make about why it is that it leads, um, and they have some, and I and I and I also have uh, some ideas about it. I think the first one is that nonviolent resistance allows um, more broad participation in organizing than armed resistance does. Armed resistance tends to be something clandestine that is done by a small group of people, uh, often men, although of course there's many significant examples of, of women participating in that as well. Um, and in allowing for, and in not only allowing, but in calling for mass participation of the population, it is a more democratic movement. And it allows for um, groups of people to exercise their political muscle. And in exercising their political muscle, you are gonna be creating citizens that are more active in the future government that gets created. So it leads to more democracy uh, because it was a movement that involved a greater number of people. Um, I think that what um, the, the sort of one of the key pieces that was critical for me was another research um, that showed that when women are involved uh, and when there is a, in the movement's ideology, there is a call for uh, gender equality, um, there it's much more likely that that movement will adopt nonviolent resistance. So you can make a bridge here to say that when women are involved, movements tend to be more successful. Um, and I think that is that both resonates with my own experience um, as a documentary filmmaker for, for many years now observing uh, movements on the ground um, and uh, the research is there to, to back it up. And I think the key though is that it's often the case that after movements happen and uh, especially after movements are successful, when the history of that movement is written, women are erased. And if we don't have the role models of these women that led to successful movements, what kind of lessons are we teaching to future generations, especially today when we're grappling with serious global problems of epic proportions that are gonna set the future of many generations? Um, what are the stories that we're telling to them about how do we build effective movements? Who needs to be involved? What are the ideologies that we want baked into these movements so that we actually end up with citizens that have exercised their political muscle, that know how to speak their voice, that know how to communicate, that know how to negotiate and compromise and understand the other and see the other so that we can actually have functioning democracies in the future. Yes, but on the other hand, you also mentioned that uh, the Oslo Accord did not in, um, include women by design because women represent a threat. So how come? How come if uh, we are including women in some of those um, areas that I mean, need, needs to be put in, put in. I mean, if we do not un include, and how come these women um, uh, produce any, any, uh, any kind of threat? Um, I'm referring to Naila and the uprising. Yeah. Um, and just for a little bit of context for people who haven't seen the film, Naila and the uprising tells the story of Palestinian women who played a key role in the first intifada. Um, and by means of, a, of context, which again, um, is, is one of the things that we looked a lot before making the film, was research that has shown, and this is separate from the two ones that I've already mentioned, but research that shows that specifically involving women in peace negotiations, so not talking more about the sort of community organizing, movement building phase, now I'm talking about, okay, the two parties sat down on the table and they're now negotiating the terms of the agreement for peace to be established. Um, and there, there's a lot that goes into that moment. And um, there is a significant um, uh, research that's shown across the board historically, when you include women in peace negotiations, when they're sitting at the table, you lead to more stable and long lasting peace agreements. Um, and I think, again, that, that reflects, I think, the history of um, and the tragedy of the Oslo peace process, uh, where uh, women, Palestinian women in particular, who played a leading role during the first intifada, which was the movement that created the political climate 
that made it possible for enough pressure to be applied on Israel for it to accept to sit down with Palestinian counterparts for the first time. So it was the first time that Palestinians were invited to the negotiating table to discuss their future. Um, and the first steps of negotiations uh, were, were called the Madrid um, negotiations process and then Washington. And those initial phases included the Palestinian women that had played a leading role in um, the first intifada in organizing their communities. Um, that uh, that ne negotiation was actually um, reflective of the desires and of the needs and of what the community on the ground, Palestinians living in Gaza and living in the West Bank, actually were calling for, uh, which included um, uh, an actual um, a negotiation of the status of Jerusalem, of actually um, uh, declaring fully that settlements were illegal and um, not allowing any more settlements to be constructed, uh, that actually wanted to discuss specific borders uh, all of these elements that determine the quality of, of liberty and of freedom for Palestinians were erased off the table in the Oslo process. And when Oslo kicked in, which was a secret negotiation that happened simultaneously to some of the, to some of the other track that included Palestinian women, uh, those women weren't informed. Uh, it was one of the I think, most... Um, Powerful moments for me was hearing Zahira Kamal, who was this Palestinian leader, uh, who is a Palestinian leader, amazing woman, um, who said that she heard about the Oslo peace process through the media. So this woman who dedicated years, yeah. sacrificed her life, sacrificed the safety of her family during the movement, and then was actively participating in tough negotiations, taking on like a lot of heat and standing up for what she knew was the right position that Palestinians should take, then the rug was pulled from under her, another negotiation had started. She was not only not invited, she was not informed yeah. that it was happening until mm -hmm. she saw it on television. Yes. And we live today with the consequences of that decision of not including Zahira Kamal and other women in the Oslo peace process. Absolutely. Honestly, I truly can relate to everything and anything you say when you say that the uh, women um, showcases women struggle worldwide. Just remember, I have my own experience back in Tehran when it was, um, I mean, Beheshti was writing the, rebel, I mean, the Constitution, and then he included women, but somehow with the rewrite, they just... Um, just basically erased many of the rights that has been there on the books for women. They just erased it and created a big, big chaos, big chaos. And women were, were so much upset. So it was uh, riot, not riots. It was so much protests and demonstrations on the street mm -hmm. and really threat, uh, threatens the Iranian government. And then I can exactly resonate with what you say because um, it, 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 it does make, uh, creates a, um, um, uneasiness. So going back to your experience, Steve is asking about the 9-11 and is saying that um, uh, after 9-11, you began focusing on U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. What is specifically drew you mm -hmm. to this focus and what specific things did you, did you learn? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Steve, for the question. The, the experience of, of being a student um, in the United States, a foreign student, uh, in the aftermath of September 11 was really transformative because in the immediate moment after September 11, there was this sense of um, support for the United States internationally. You felt it. I, I heard there was a sense of like, well, the United States has just been attacked and there was a sense of solidarity um, that the United States under the right leadership could have galvanized that moment of solidarity to actually create a whole new relationship with the world internationally and 
a, a whole new role for this giant superpower that is the United States and how it lives and breathes and relates to other nations in the world because there was a lot of solidarity. Um, instead, the, the leadership of the country, what they did with it in, in, this, in seizing this moment of, of enormous pain in, in, in among New Yorkers who experienced a, a, a deadly attack with thousands of people dead, um, even more uh, uh, displaced from downtown New York. Uh, I uh, became, I sort of had friends who lived in that area who couldn't go home for three months, had to leave, run away quickly in that moment uh, without their clothes, without their books. They became you know, internally displaced people in New York City, came to live with me. So the pain was, was real. And, and the way that that was used was to attack the other, was to vilify mm -hmm. and to use that moment uh, to, uh, to create more pain and more death. And I found that um, uh, both uh, really sad and also infuriating. And I saw what that did to people around me um, and uh, you know, the, the fear that was instilled that this was just the beginning, that the United States was now under attack and that we need to go after um, the people who did that to us and the people who did that to us all of a sudden became a, a country that had nothing to do, meaning Iraq, uh, with the actual attacks um, of what happened and a country that actually had a lot to do with it, meaning Saudi Arabia, continues to be treated with kids' gloves instead of being held into account for the horrendous human rights violations that it commits and has committed both domestically and internationally. And I knew that at that moment, I needed to understand more. I had so many questions. I, you know, I, again, a foreign student, young foreign student uh, on campus at Columbia University witnessing this and my desire became to learn. And I, I dove into all the classes that I could. I got connected to different activist groups. I became active in the anti-war movement. So I would take buses to Washington DC in the very small left-wing protests that would happen every weekend uh, to try to prevent uh, the war in Iraq from happening. Um, that as you know, we are living till this day with the horrendous consequences of that invasion. Um, and um, and one one thing just opened more, you know, the 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 what the knowledge was insati insatiable, insatiable. Is that the way we're saying? Uh, the more that I learned, the more that I wanted to um, um, to to know more about it. Yeah, Neelam says it's a great topic. So you kept saying foreign students, and you kept saying I was a foreign student at the Columbia University. Why being a foreign student and not specifically and particularly being an American student influenced you as a person to just dig in? Would you be thinking that maybe this may happen to my own country or what was what was, you know, just this brewing um, uneasiness yeah. in you? I think that's a fair question, because I actually think that 9-11 was a was a really critical moment for a lot of Americans as well. Um, and so I don't think that necessarily that was specific to, I mean, it's my own experience being a foreign student, uh, but I think that many Americans, in fact, my husband also, uh, who is from North Carolina, had a, a huge shift in his, in his life um, uh, after September 11. And I have many, both close friends and colleagues in the area that I work, uh, foreign and American. I think for, for our generation, it was is it was one of those moments that that changed uh, people's lives and and people's interests and people's careers and and direction in life. Um, I think specifically as a foreigner, there was a, a a harder time in having conversations around American foreign policy. I was not concerned that that Brazil was going to get invaded. You know, you know, I there is plenty of history of manipulation in uh, in Brazilian government by the the U.S government, uh, but that wasn't my immediate concern. I was, um, I was just uh, surprised by how difficult it was to have conversations around US foreign policy and, um, and didn't feel equipped to have those conversations at the depth that, the, that, um, that was necessary. And so that was um, what led me to want to learn more. 
Yes, yes. Parisa says, as you see, the result of 9-11 showed the atrocity and attack uh, toward one uh, target, one minority religion to give more excuse to carry the agenda in the Middle East. So thank you so much. Um, stay with me, Julia. You are watching to Peace Mindedly. Actually, you are listening to Peace Mindedly, a podcast show featuring peaceful bridge makers. At the same time, you are watching Peace Mindedly. I am live streaming the conversation every week on Tuesdays and Thursdays on, on Facebook. My aim is to get exactly the kind of uh, activities and interactions that I receive from uh, my friends and the audience who are interested in peace and uh, spreading kindness and compassion towards uh, towards themselves with, uh, for themselves and for their communities questions like steve is asking parisa is asking henna is uh, asking and also the interaction that i have uh, as I said, uh, the program is every Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, it's going to continue up until the end of June and the preseason is going to finish. And uh, with my team, I'm just going to review how we did and how we need to move forward. For Thursday, I am talking with Michelle Garrett, a peace builder and a peace researcher. Garrett consults different stakeholders and communities in uh, countries around the world about how to strategically approach peace to address remaining conflict. The show is on May 28 at 2.30. It's 2.30 May 28, but uh, in June I'm moving to 12.30 because of some technical issues. So starting June on Tuesdays and Thursdays, the same show is going to be uh, live uh, featuring my guests at 12.30. Uh, June 2nd, I am talking with Anila Afsali, Muslim peace activist and executive director for uh, Amen, Amen, short for American Muslim Empowerment Network. On Thursday, June 4th, 12.30 Pacific time, I'm talking with three peaceful, wise moms about a book they've written together for their daughters. The book titled, Three Wise Moms, Our Lessons, their life. So I'm going to talk with the moms uh, and I'm sure that we're going to have lots of suggestions and comments for the mom during the um, uneasiness of uh, um, and, and how to deal with our teenage daughters. So um, please uh, find Peace Mindedly on Apple Podcast, on Google Podcast, on iHeartRadio, and also on Spotify or anywhere that you find your audio learnings. And when you find us, please do subscribe because uh, we need to see how we are doing, uh, doing the show. For this hour, I'm talking with uh, Julia Basha. Julia is creative director for Just Vision, a nonpartisan and religiously unaffiliated nonprofit organization who tells the stories of Palestinians and Israelis uh, grassroots grassroot leaders. These people want to end the occupation in Palestine and uh, Julia Coates to build a future of freedom, dignity, and equality for all. In Basha's film, women have heavy presence. In her latest film, Naila and the Uprising, a network of Palestinian women led one of the most vibrant and sustained nonviolent civil resistance in the Middle East. We were just talking about Naila and the Uprising, and I'm going to ask more questions from Julia. Hi, Julia. So you said that you believe putting this story. Um, so, so here's the here's the thing. I, as a filmmaker, as a writer, public speaker, and a woman who is really out there and doing some of this uh, great, um, um, great movies and great work, does women have uh, the same uh, the same presence um, in in all in in the latest movie that you are uh, you are producing? So, do we see a heavy presence of women in the movie? Um, so the films that I've made all in some way or another feature women, and that's true of this one too. There's a very strong uh, protagonist in it. Um, and I want to just sort of 
take a, a step in term, uh, a step back in terms of this conversation around women. Um, and this is something that I've reflected a lot about. And I think, you know, in a world that is so heavily unequal, uh, gender wise that it is today, um, it is critical for us to bring that voice out as much as possible. Um, it is um, an, a world in which women have had to find different ways of accomplishing the things that they need and in having to navigate things differently, that often leads to creativity. And being creative about how to solve problems is a thing that we need in our world today. And so bringing out those voices is so important. What we can't lose track of is that it isn't just about having a woman or any women on screen. It is really about those qualities around what makes women often able to be creative, to find the other way, to find a solution that isn't the one that requires an enormous amount of violence. And that kind of thinking and that kind of strategy and creative thinking can come from men, women, and come from anyone, really. Um, I think that it's just that often women were, have been called upon to exercise that muscle more often because of the position that they occupy in society. Because of the position they occupy in the, in the society, and, and one of those positions might be motherhood. Because if you are mother, so here's, here's my question, how men and women in your experience really view a conflict differently? Or how do they view it the same way? So what is your experience? I think that because of the different roles that men and women play, particularly when societies are, are more patriarchal, um, which is almost every society <laughs> around the world today, uh, but obviously there's, there's some degrees of that. Um, I think that women often, in the case of specifically where I spend the most time yeah, of the, the Palestinian struggle, um, what you saw in that, in that specific case was that women often were the ones in the West Bank who knew where the aquifers were because they were responsible for getting the water and bringing it to their homes. Now, aquifers in the West Bank is a critical resource. So when you go into the Oslo Accords and now you're negotiating borders and you're negotiating which settlement stays and which don't, knowing that information, knowing where villages sit and how people need to move about and where are different communities and where different families live, having that knowledge is really important. And women were the holders of that knowledge. So losing Palestinian women um, from the Oslo Accords was a huge liability when now you are negotiating big decisions around uh, territorial um, borders. Um, in other respects, you, you see other things. So you mentioned uh, caregiving. Uh, traditionally, now women have played a much bigger role in, um, in taking care of, of children. I think that is beginning to change. And I've seen enormous, I've seen in my life enormous changes, for example, generationally. Uh, in uh, what was the role of my parents and how much actually more I am in in a relationship now where it's much more equal. And so I think there's progress being made, but I do think that traditionally women have played more of, done more of the caregiving for children. Um, and I think that leads to a wealth of understanding of knowledge, again, that you need to be able to have present uh, both if you are building a movement, if you are negotiating peace, um, if you're doing, you know, all the, the, the acts of, of consequence to a community and to a society, you need to be able to have that input. Absolutely. How come the conflict between Israel and Palestine um, is important to you? Um, so the way that I ended up getting involved in Israel and Palestine was not a direct way. So going back to uh, the, the, our little personal history, uh, I think the where we landed was when I landed in Cairo. Uh, and I was in Cairo because I needed a visa to get to Iran. Um, and what happened there was that I looked at the footage that Jihan Ujain, the Egyptian documentary filmmaker, uh, who invited me to come to Cairo, had been filming. And she had been filming... Uh, inside um, Al Jazeera during the war in Iraq. And Al Jazeera is located in Doha, Qatar, 
10 miles away from the U.S. Military Central Command, which at the time was the main U.S. military headquarters in the Middle East and was transformed into media headquarters during the war. So meaning that reporters and um, correspondents from all the different um, um, publications around the world were based inside uh, Central Command, had offices there where they were being fed uh, the military narrative about what was happening in Iraq. And what Jihan did was she visited Central Command and Al Jazeera every day and saw how differently the news was being broadcast uh, from yes. these places that were just 10 miles apart. And so when I arrived and I saw all of this material, I was uh, completely um, flabbergasted and amazed that I had just seen all of that material. It touched a big nerve on me as someone who had been very active um, against can, the war in Iraq. Can you give us example, example? Do you remember in any of the examples yeah. of how these two uh, networks are covering the same news differently? Sure. I mean, I think the most, the most striking one was uh, how you wouldn't see any civilian dead in the U.S. Uh, military story about what was happening in the war. And you actually saw the enormous uh, casualty of human lives of children uh, who were bearing the toll of a, a completely mistaken military adventure into a country. Uh, that obviously has led to even more enormous um, uh, lives being lost and suffering of families across the Middle East, uh, including obviously in Syria with the civil war that we see that is a consequence, a direct consequence of the U.S. invasion uh, in, in Iraq. And I think not showing what the consequences are of, of military interventions um, was a huge gap in American media coverage and was, and was again, a direct consequence of American reporters that were embedded with the military uh, and getting their news only through that. And so I felt that it was really important to tell that story and I decided to join Jehan um, in supporting, making the film and became the writer and editor of what was became Control Room, which was a documentary film um, launched in 2004. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so, haven't yeah, gotten to Israel and Palestine yet. Yes, you haven't. <laughs> you haven't. So how come? So then, uh, making a long story short, yeah. you you got interested in uh, you you produced a control room, and then and then probably you just um, notice ways in which uh, the the powers are playing their part within the region. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, I've always was very aware of Israel and Palestine, and um, what what actually happened, which was a coincidence, was that um, uh, an Israeli Canadian human rights advocate called Ronit Avni saw Control Room and got in touch with me, and she was at the time making a film um, about bereaved families, Palestinians and Israelis who had lost loved ones, and um, was looking for an editor, and invited me to uh, work on the project and. I told her that we were, I was game if we went back to the region and, um, and one thing led to another and we ended up shooting a lot of material there and, and made uh, what became Just Vision's first film, just called Encounter Point, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was going to be one off, but one off, but ended up leading to the past 15 years of making films in the region. And then, um, and then you, you decided uh, how, how the Just Vision created very briefly? Mm -hmm. So Ronit um, Avni uh, decided that she wanted to make sure that um, the stories of individuals on the ground, Palestinians and Israelis, who are working for a future of justice and equality in the region, that they got visibility. Because after doing an extensive research on the ground uh, among peace activists, among community organizers, the number one issue that they cited as, as a challenge in their ability to do better work was invisibility. And so her goal through Just Vision was making the invisible visible. Um, and that uh, was, a, 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 at that time, a project when I joined and eventually over the years, um, we were able to build the organization and build the sort of institutional uh, capacity to right now be not only making films, but we also co-publish a Hebrew language newspaper with Plus 972 uh, called Sihame Komit, which, is, which tells the stories that the Israeli mainstream media is missing. So it was an intervention that we felt was really important within the Israeli context 
um, that was uh, missing really important stories at um, is this on an still, level. Is this is still publishing? It's still publishing. It's in English. It's uh, called Local Call. Um, it is in Hebrew, uh, but a lot of the stories are translated or are co-published with, with Plus 972, which is an English language uh, news magazine. And so it is accessible to English language readers through Plus 972. Julia, why do we need Israelis in this battle? Why Say it again. Why do we need Israelis, Israelis in this battle? For justice, you mean? The battle mm -hmm. for justice? Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think as with any movements across the world uh, that you've seen, if the future is supposed to be a future of equality and justice, it has to be a future of equality and justice for all communities. Uh, you can't, you don't uh, solve an injustice by creating another one. Uh, and so it's critical to work with um, the uh, oppressors, in this case, the Israeli government being the more powerful party uh, in this conflict, uh, you need to engage Israeli citizens. If you look at um, the struggle for the civil rights movement in the United States uh, was very inclusive of uh, white Americans, uh, many of whom came from northern states to the south to take huge risks with their own lives uh, in similar ways that we see Israeli citizens uh, in pretty much all of um, the movies that we've made at Just Vision, taking enormous risks to their own life and to their public standing in their communities to stand for justice and equality because they know that until Palestinians have justice and until Palestinians have equality, until Palestinians have dignity, Israelis can't have any of that either. What do you want to see from the Israelis part of doing in order to reach the kind of equality and fair society that you're talking about? What do you want to see from the Israeli part? I see Israelis and Palestinians uh, leading the way in what needs to happen. Um, I don't necessarily um, uh, feel equipped to um, th say what exactly people need to be doing. I think the leadership comes locally and comes from the ground and those uh, individuals are pathing, um, are leading the way into the, the movement. If you talk to many activists, both Israeli and Palestinian activists, people have the vision. People have the vision of a shared future where there is equality for both communities, where there is justice, where people live in dignity. And I think what is lacking is that we don't hear from them and we don't know about them. And if we, if we don't know, then how are we going to be able to find ways to support uh, those individuals on the ground? So I think if people want to hear more, I think watching our films, um, I think all of our films are available online. Many of them are available for free. Um, others are available on uh, common uh, streaming platforms. Um, Nyland Uprising is currently streaming on PBS. Um, Budrus is available on, on Amazon as well as on our own website at justvision.org. Uh, um, and um, and I think getting informed and learning uh, is a really important piece for internationals and for Americans to find ways that they can get constructively engaged in supporting Israelis and Palestinians on the ground that have the vision for a future. So exactly, Julia said what I wanted to explain, and I'm going to go back to Julia very, very soon. If you really want to support Julia and Just Vision and the, the great work that they are doing, this is what you, you really need to do. You uh, you need to support Peace and support Just Vision, support Julia and the great work that she is doing. Um, you can find a wealth of information about Julia, about this program, and about, I'm going to add it, and edit the audio portion of the program and post it on goldtune.com, G-O-L-T-U-N-E.com. It's a website I manage with a group of in, uh, foreign correspondents filing stories about uh, mostly women and uh, about uh, things are happening in the Middle East and around the world uh, related to the lifestyle and, and related to peace. So please do check goldtune.com. And for this hour, we are talking with uh, Julia Basha, writer, filmmaker, research, and public speaker. 
uh, here I usually uh, I usually ask my guests to close the program for us. Before I do that, I, this is the, my last announcement that Peace Mindedly is available on Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts. Find this amazing. Um, discussion that Julia is giving us lots of the wealth of information about how to get involved, how to support and how to learn more about what really matters for people around the world. So Julia and her organization is trying to make invisible visible and we need to see them. At the end of the program, I ask my guests to close the pro program for us with something meaningful about peace and about compassion and kindness. Before I go there, I want to bring Julia and I want to play Steve's uh, comments that uh, whether or not you, you, you have ever had unwanted attention about the uh, movie that you're making. Um, we've we've had obviously a lot of different interactions with uh, both the Israeli government and the Palestinian government over our various films. I mean, most recently with Nyla and the uprising, um, we uh, had to face um, some very active uh, attempts uh, from uh, the Israeli government at shutting down our screenings and preventing the film from being shown. Um, and uh, it was very interesting to see that play out. And I think it touched on um, a lot of questions around um, uh, what, what people can see and what they can see and what is the danger of watching a film about Palestinian women who are uh, leading a nonviolent effort uh, for freedom and dignity. And um, I think our, uh, our way of, of dealing with it uh, was and has always been to want to bring more people to the conversation and to want to be inclusive um, of, of questions and engaging. And so we actually made the film Nile and the Uprising available for free um, for um, Israelis on Siha Mekomit, which is the Hebrew language website um, that, that we publish. And so the film uh, is currently available for people and has led to very interesting discussions. Excellent. So, um, I'm asking questions um, on uh, with, um, um, questions from Facebook. So if you are listening, the way it's uh, acting and interacting uh, the discussion is I bring the questions that the audience are asking from Facebook. That's why I'm going back and forth time to time uh, between my own questions and the questions from the friends on, on Facebook. And Julia, now is your time if you would like to close the program for us mm -hmm. with something meaningful about peace and and your own thoughts mm -hmm. thank you obviously we're living under a huge crisis that where every life has been affected around the world today uh, we've been at home uh, schools are closed our if we have kids our kids at home and we're trying to work from home uh, many of us have uh, bear the worst um, of the consequences in losing loved ones. And if you are one of them, I um, send my greatest condolences and a huge um, virtual hug. Um, and I'm sorry uh, for the pain that you must be feeling right now. This is a really, really challenging time for, for everyone. Um, what has been keeping me going um, has actually been um, child, uh, childhood program. Uh, that my kids, I have a four-year-old and I have a six-year-old. Uh, and there's a show um, on PBS that is called Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, which is based on uh, Mr. Rogers, uh, which was not a, a show that I watched because I grew up in Brazil and it's a show that played here uh, in the United States. But um, Mr. Rogers has this great saying that kind of permeates also all of the values that guide um, the, the my, my Neighborhood show that is on PBS these days, um, which is about uh, pay attention to the helpers. When you're in a crisis, to look for the helpers. And uh, when I think of the helpers today, I think about all the frontline workers who are don't have the benefit of 
staying at home and trying to work from home and caring for their children while working. Uh, the juggling that is so hard for so many people, uh, they uh, don't have that. That's a privilege that we have. And so I try to think about it as a privilege. And I try to think about um, all of the nurses in the hospitals and all of the doctors and all of the grocery workers and the delivery people um, and uh, the risks that they are taking to keep uh, the economy going and keep our um, society functioning right now. Um, while we hope that true leadership emerges to um, deal with this crisis in a way that is responsible and to take into account that every single one of our lives matter today. Um, and I wish you all well. And um, thank you so much, Sarah, for having me in your show. Absolutely. We have lots of comments about, I couldn't play all of those, about how wonderful you are, a courageous lady, lots of comments, but uh, amazing discussion. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for the work that you do. Um, God bless. And exactly as you said, hope we, we will prevail and hope we prevail in a way that uh, brings more meaning and more kindness and more peace into our lives. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. <laughs>